so you already know this paper is going to be about uh, these guys, and you know something about them already. What you don't know <coughs> is that they spend a lot of time and energy not just fishing, but converting fish into what they call work for the ancestors. They spend an enormous amount of emotional uh, energy, time, money to work for the ancestors, mainly um, building tombs, these fences that they're building here, around uh, family tombs that contain members of the descent group, and then also uh, building and raising crosses that are dedicated to individual uh, dead people. Now, to understand why they work for the ancestors, we need to understand something of what they think happens after people die. On the basis of ethnographic evidence, and having spent a long time with these people, having participated in these rituals, having contributed money and time and emotional investment in the construction of these tools myself, as an ethnographer, I can come up with a summary description of what happens after death. I'm giving you here a kind of standard ethnographic account, which you would find in my ethnographic work. And it goes something like this. When a person dies, the spirit, which is called angatse, after the person has died, the same entity is known with a different name before the person has died, it's known as a fanahi. The spirit and let's say, permanent, permanently departs from the body. I say permanently because the fanahi also departs from the body when people dream, for example, when people are asleep. But at death, that disjunction happens forever. The fanahi doesn't come back to the body. As a result of this permanent separation between the fanahi and the body, the angels and the body, the body starts to decompose, but the spirit, the angels, continues its existence in a disembodied form, typically wandering around the village, in entering people's dreams, which is why people say we know that the angels survive, because in our dreams we actually see the person rejoined momentarily in our dream, the body and the spirit together. So could I ask just one question? The one that leaves you at night when you dream, is it identical to the one that leaves you forever? I don't know. I haven't done inferential studies on that. It's called, I mean, people say what we call fanai when the person is alive. We call angatsi when the person is alive. They tell a story whereby if I'm asleep and people put uh, clay or special stuff that women use as a kind of uh, beauty cream on their face. <coughs> the fanari comes back and doesn't recognize my body as my body. And so I die forever because the fanari doesn't come back to me and that fanari becomes unnecessary, which suggests that they think of the two entities as very similar. Um, so the, the Agatha wanders around the village, enters people's dreams, complains that it feels lonely, demands food, drinks, demands attention, demands a new house, in the construction of a new tomb, and so on and so forth. OK, so that is my ethnographic story. And I'm here giving you some of the questions that motivated the kind of research and studies that I'm presenting today, which are, how exactly do those children come to share the kinds of representation about what happens after death? about the afterlife with their parents and elders, uh, emphasis on exactly, given that very often kind of ethnographic accounts of how children learn are very dissatisfying, as Larry has pointed out in the story the other day. What is the nature of these representations in the minds of parents and elders? Um, do children actually learn about the survival of the Angatse? And if so, how? I will explain the meaning of this question in a second. 
is it hard or easy to learn about the afterlife? Generally speaking, especially in this talk, the emphasis is going to be on general questions about the process of cultural transmission, trying to be as precise as I can about that process. So let me present you what I refer to as the anthropological common sense, which again, uh, Larry has alluded to the other day, which says something like, uh, religious representations, like any other cultural representations, are received, kind of ready-made, acquired all of a piece as children grow up in their historically constituted environments. This sort of common sense has been critically labeled uh, variously by Maurice, for example, who talks about the first to this as the anthropological theory of cognition, Pascal, who has referred to it as the theory of exhausted cultural transmission. Everything that a child knows has been transmitted to him or her, or so since we have referred to it as the facts model of internalization. You have other culture, you have the fax machine, and bingo on the other side, you have a socialized uh, child. By contrast, uh, what I here refer to the, common, the cognitive common sense says something like, uh, religious representations are transmitted and successfully acquired thanks to the evolved properties of the human mind. So that the argument here, which has been developed by Pascal is, and others, is that the human mind is equipped with infant systems that have evolved <coughs> to deal with uh, predators, cooperation, contagiousness, and so on and so forth. And the argument is that religious beliefs, religious representations, run on these inference systems that are not specifically religious. They kind of free ride on what is already there, which is the kind of position that Maurice has criticized last week. Now, this is the kind of the, the background, but when it comes to a specific uh, type of entity, ancestors, ghosts, and the representation of the afterlife, the cognitive common sense seems to split into two different positions, which I refer here as the cultural induced counterintuitively, which would be following Pascal's uh, uh, theory, and, and what I refer to as natural intuition. There is a claim, so this is what I've already said. Ancestor ghosts and ideas about the afterlife, <coughs> the argument would be spread easily because they optim optimally violate these intuitive assumptions delivered by these influence systems. On this side, instead, there is a claim which says, actually, they're not culturally induced free riding on these influence systems that are already there. But ideas about ancestor ghosts and the afterlife are really quite intuitive in their own right. They don't need any cultural input. Uh, much like knowing that unsupported objects fall to the ground as shown by Susan and so on and so forth. And here is a quote from Jesse Bering, who has recently published a paper in the BBS called Focus Psychology of Souls, where he claims that the general belief in the continuity of mental states in the agents seems not something that children acquire as a product of their social religious upbringing. Instead, a natural disposition toward afterlife beliefs is more like the default cognitive stance and interacts with various learning channels. So the claim here is that children come with a default intuition that after death, something continues. Now, the evidence that Bering has in a series of studies that he has uh, done is that he asked children to judge what continues to function and what doesn't after they are shown a puppet show where a crocodile eats a mouse. Um, this study was highly constrained by the fact that in post-September 11 US, he couldn't even say, now that the mouse is dead, he had to say, now that the mouse is not alive. <laughs> children could not cope with the word death. In any case, uh, what he finds is that despite the fact that children know that bodily functions end 
when the mouse is not alive. Um, preschoolers seem to be more immortalist than older children and adults. In other words, they think that more survives mental states particularly of the mouse after death than older children. And from that, he infers that belief in the afterlife is not the result of social religious upbringing, but is this default cognitive stance that children have. Now, Bering's findings contradict other findings by Paul Harris and Martha Gimenez, who in a study in Spain asked children what continues to function, what doesn't after a person dies. I'm not going to go into this, maybe we can discuss this in the discussion if you're interested. To my mind, it makes an awful lot of difference that Bering is talking about the mouse and uh, Harris and Guinness are talking about a person. What they find is the opposite, is that older children, not younger children, are more immortalist. In other words, the older you are, the more likely you are to say that something survives after death. Particularly, these older children are more likely to be swayed by explicit religious priming, which I will tell you more in a second. So Harris and Gimenez infer the opposite. They infer that belief in the afterlife appears to be the result of social religious upbringing. This is clear, yeah? OK, so I want to know what we would find among uh, these children, and I want to know how they represent uh, the ancestors and the afterlife. So I've adopted, this is a study I've done in collaboration with Paul Harris, and I've used uh, a modification of Harris and Guinness' death interview, by which I tell participants um, a story about a fictional character who I call Rampy, and the story is about Rampy who falls ill, the family takes him to the hospital, he gets several injections, and then he dies, which is unfortunately a very familiar scenario to my informants. And then I say, now that Rampy is dead, and I then ask a series of questions. And the questions are questions about body parts and bodily processes, and questions about sensory, emotional, and cognitive processes, which for the sake of brevity I call the mental. Uh, so for example, we ask, do his eyes work? Match to, does he see? We ask, does his stomach need food? Does he know the name of his wife? Does he miss his children? Now, remember my ethnographic account about the body rots and decomposes, the agatsit continues uh, as a spiritual entity to survive. If you bring that story to this task, you, I would expect people to answer that the body parts and body processes do not function after death, whereas mental processes continue to function, at least some of them continue to function after death. So that means the prediction that we would find some kind of differentiation between uh, the brown and the blue, between the body and the mental. Just to remind you what I said last time, let me just say um, why I'm bothering asking these weird questions to my informants. Well, the ancestors are dead. Everyone will tell you that. Uh, so I want to know what Vesu mean by that word. What do they mean by dead? What are the consequences of death? And what are the properties that sustain life and are sustained by life, which end when death occurs? And they also say that the ancestors continue to interact with the living in their dreams, bothering you, asking for things, and so on and so forth. So I want to know what's, what survives after a person dies, which properties exactly uh, remain viable <coughs> after death. Now, why do I ask in this particular way through this Paris and Guinness interview? And this is reference to what I said last time. And I'm drawing here on the, uh, your attention to the difference that I uh, highlighted in my other presentation between asking people to state their knowledge and using their knowledge to make novel inferences. Because I'm presenting you uh, children's results, I just want to make a point which I didn't make last time, which 
children are famously, whether they're Malagasy or American or English or whatever, or Spanish, famously very poor at putting things into words. That even when they have a bit of knowledge, they're much better at using that knowledge rather than telling you that they have that knowledge. And that's why clever people like the ones we've heard right, this morning, for example, do the, the things that they do with faces. And they elicit the knowledge that babies, infants, children have. Um, now, the point here is that adults, basal Italian, English, or whatever, tend to be very good, unlike children, at putting things into words. The reason, as I'll show you, I bothered to use these inferential tasks as I did with inheritance tasks last time, as I'm doing with the death interview this time with adults, is because it may well be that because they are so good at putting things into words, <coughs> they may, you might miss the fact that actually they have knowledge that they don't put into words, but that they use in their inferential reasoning. So in a way, I'm using a technique that's been used, that's been designed to capture knowledge that children have and they can't express, to get around what adults are too good at expressing, which might hide knowledge that they have but don't express. That's clear. So I use the task with five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, a group of nine to 17 year olds who I shall call children um, and adults. I'm not going to show you the actual graphs yet. I will in a second. I just want to give you the kind of feel of how they answered. Five year olds, so here we are talking about, there are seven questions about bodily properties and seven questions about mental properties. And what we're looking for is that differentiation between their judgments that the body rots and the animals is survive. Uh, five years, five-year-olds were chance on this task. Seven-year-olds did not differentiate body and mind, and they mostly judged that neither the body nor the mind survives after death. Nine to 17 year olds differentiated body from mind. Um, and so they said the body rots, but some mental property survives. And adults did the same, but they did it more. They attributed more mental properties to the disease than the group of older children. In other words, I'm not going to spend time on these kids. I'm very aware that there, are, there is evidence by Clark Barrett that you can elicit an understanding of biological death in the context of predation, which I tried to do by doing a study where instead of the person who had a bird, which the children themselves hunt and kill. Um, I'm aware that this may be a result that's more to do with the task that I've used. I've tried to replicate Clark Barrett's study with the mouse in it and a cat, I didn't get anywhere. So, but I'm, I'm just leaving it for the moment. It, it's possible that these children understand more than I was able to elicit, but let's leave them to the side for the moment. The seven-year-olds who didn't differentiate between body and mind, you could say, are construing death as, I can't pronounce this word, annihilation, thank you, of both the body and the mind. The older children appear to have got the point that the body rots, but the animals survive, and so have done the adults in a slightly more um, precise way. Before reaching this conclusion that seems to replicate my ethnographic account as far as those participants up there, the kind of mature members of the community are concerned, I want to question that um, Conclusion, <coughs> conclusion in two, both for the adults and for the older children. To do that, I'm going to actually show you some graphs um, where instead of thinking in terms of the mean number of judgments which my, this story is based on, I'm actually going to show you 
the distribution of judgment. So what you have here, here's the body, here's the mind. Uh, this is the number of possible does not work judgments that participants could make from seven for the body, seven for the mind. And this is the percentage of participants who actually gave that number of discontinu discontinuity does not work judgments. And this is what you find. Okay, what that means, this is what I'm interested in, is that 43% of adults in the story where I said Raketa goes to the hospital and he dies, 43% said that none of the mental properties that I probed uh, survive. And the children, even more so, 57% of them, said that nothing at all survives. Now, if I think of this with reference to my experience in the village, I just think, well, it doesn't make sense because what I'm, I'm, I'm getting here is that it seems that half of these people don't think that the Angatze survives, and if that's so, why do they bother doing the ritual? Okay, it, it's a result that suggests that a considerable percentage of people do not think that the, the spirit, that mental properties survive after death. Now, skeptical anthropologists may say, well, of course the findings don't make ethnographic sense because of the contrived methodology that I've used, so I'm getting what I deserve. Nonsense. <laughs> I asked him, I asked him about that person. I never used the word ancestor. I just said, now that Rampi is dead. And you never tried asking about ancestors? Just a second. I did, just a second. So a non-skeptical, friendly reaction um, he is, well, maybe what's, what's happening in, in my Rampi study is that I just didn't make the context relevant to people so that they didn't actually um, use the idea of the ancestors, which I didn't prime in any way, and that they will do so only when the representation of the afterlife is made contextually relevant uh, to them. I think before we just let it go on laughing, you know, the skeptical reaction, let's, uh, I mean, let's face exactly what it would be. It would be, why do they know? I mean, it's a bit like a, one could, an, an anthropologist could say, if you ask children how many toes the Virgin Mary has, are you eliciting their knowledge about the Virgin Mary? Well, it's very doubtful, even though they probably will all of us attend. So how would you defend yourself against Wait, that? Why isn't that about the Virgin Mary? What? I don't understand why that's if you, if you If you ask a child, a Catholic child, how many toes does the Virgin Mary have? Uh, they probably will answer you 10, but it probably would be wrong to assume that the child knows in any meaningful way that the Virgin Mary has 10 toes. So I think there is an instance where... Just know that people have 10 toes. The Virgin Mary is a person? Yes, that's right, but it, it has no significance to them until the moment that question is asked. Is that uh, supposed to be a, a, a friendly or unfriendly? Unfriendly In the sense that it was answered, it was, it was, you know, assumed that the skeptical reaction was nonsense. No, I'm not assuming that. No, no, I'm right. just going to show you that it is nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, it's, it's, it's friendly in that sense, but it's, uh, it's, you know, I think it's very easy. I'm trying my audience to accept this by telling them that it could be. I mean, there's plenty of places when methodologies are ill, are contrived and don't produce good results. Like telling people, asking people, why do your baby, who do your babies look like, and inferring from that, that is it. Anyway, can I get back to? Okay, so I'm taking this alternative uh, possibility, and of course I'm doing it because I know from Paul Harris's study that he has precisely done that and got the results that I'm hoping, um, actually, well, that, I, that I'm getting, although I must say that when I did it, I didn't actually think that I would get uh, the, concept, the, the, the effect that I did. 
So in any case, the manipulation was that instead of telling the story about Ramfi going to the hospital with an illness, getting injections and dying, I'm now priming, I never talk about ancestors, but I'm telling a story about Erapetu, who dies in the kind of way that I've tried to evoke the kind of uh, scene that Morris was alluding to the other day, where the old person dies surrounded by all the children, their children, their children, and I prime the work. I say, and now his descendants are happy because they have done the work for him. And in the case of children, I had um, drawings. Uh, instead of having the corpse on the bed, I had the cross in the family tomb. When you said, the first when you introduced your Rambi story, you said, which unfortunately is a familiar case. That uh, it was my, just to say that it's not a weird story. People get ill, go to the local town hospital, get several random injections and die. I see, but it's still not, I mean, there's still this distinction between what relevant context of death. And, so now, you're, what, how, how do you reconcile the fact that many visual people are used to seeing people go to the hospital, die, and so on, with your claim that still there is an important difference between the dying surrounding the children and the not? For, 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 for the kids. Sounds what I'm saying is, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm rhetorically now presenting you the story as if I told them this story, I got half of them saying nothing survives. I tell, I prime them with the ancestors. So of course, I'm priming here as well, just as much. I'm priming them to think about a dead piece of flesh here. And here I'm priming them to think about what you do for your dead people once they're buried and they start wandering around the village and wanting things and acquiring a new house and so on and so forth. We can come back to that, sure, sure, sure. I just want to show you. So I've recruited another group. It's, this is not a within participant comparison. I couldn't possibly go back to the same adults and ask the silly questions again. So I recruited another group. Um, these are the data that you've already seen, and these are the new data. When I prime them to think about the tool, and what I'm interested in are the red bars. This is what I was, half of the people saying nothing at all survives, and those people uh, go down significantly, whereas here nothing much is happening for the world. Keep that in mind for later. But what I'm, I'm drawing your attention is the mental thing. So what I claim I have here is a contextual effect on what, as anthropologists, we refer to as belief, which um, turns out to be a complicated concept. Because what I'm claiming here is that what these data show is that those adults do not hold the belief that in the afterlife and in the survival of the island kind of in the abstract, um, but they are more likely to activate that representation of the afterlife in certain contexts, more saliently in ritual contexts, which is the context that I have primed. In other contexts, when they think of Rampi as a dead piece of flesh, they adhere to a different belief, quote unquote, that death is the end of everything. So, if we go back to what I had presented with you earlier, what I would want to add is that together with the representation of death as the survival of the Anatsa, people also have in their minds the representation of death as the end of everything. That these two ways of thinking about what happens after death coexist in adults' mind, with one, of course, being very explicit and culturally very salient. That's what I pick up as an ethnographer. And the other one, which is unstated most of the time and hardly articulated, it's harder to get to. Um, now, that thing means, when did I start? Two, was it? OK, what I'll do is I'll jump, and then if I have time, I'll come back. No, well, you don't know what's, uh, everyone always says this time, you don't know what's, no, they have 90 slides. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I want to comment on this first before I turn to the children. And 
What I want to comment on is to ask whether what I'm describing here might be thought of in terms of what Justin Barrett has called the kind of theologically correctness effect. If you're familiar with his work, he's sort of making a distinction, which I presume maps in certain ways onto Dan's uh, distinction between intuitive and reflective beliefs between basic concepts and theologically correct concepts. So that basic concepts are concepts that are derived from these intuitive uh, influence systems such as physics or theory of mind. And theologically correct concepts instead are concepts that violate those uh, influence systems and that require, why you don't like this? Require, huh? Is that not what he says? It doesn't matter. Doesn't make sense. What he claims and what he shows experimentally is that if you put people under cognitive pressure, for example, in a memory task, people who, when given time to think with their thinking cap on, are very capable of giving you theolo theologically correct concepts, fall back on basic concepts. They can't, if they have to think quickly on the fly, they can't hold in their minds the complicated theologically correct concepts. So you can trick people into going from this to that quite easily. So you could say, well, is then this, death is the annihilation of both body and mind, which you remember was already present here when children are seven. Could that be construed as a basic concept and the other one as a theologically correct concept? Now, the problem with this interpretation is that in fact, in my task, there is no cognitive difference. There is no difference in the cognitive demand of the task. I didn't make one task harder than the other. The Rapeto study is just as easy as the Rampi one. Um, and the effect that I got was driven simply by a, manipul a very simple manipulation of narrative context. So the evidence I have, uh, as measured by my task and my manipulation, I can't argue that the two representations of what happens after death are different because they appear to be equally accessible, given that there is no difference between the tasks. However, I think that it might be possible um, to show a kind of theologically correctness effect in a cognitively demanding um, task, in which perhaps I could show that these levels entirely fail to articulate the belief in the survival of the Angate, irrespective of context. So if I make the rapetu, the ancestral task, hard enough that people may revert to the idea that nothing survives, that everything uh, dies. And although I don't have any uh, experimental data, I think there are reasons to believe that this might actually uh, be the case. And the evidence is that in the very long discussions that this task generated after the thing was over, people, uh, adults would want to talk to me about this weird thing that we had just done and told me a lot, a lot about what they think about death and so on and so forth. It became very, very obvious that individuals give very, very different interpretations, uh, very idiosyncratic readings of what actually the angate is, where it goes, what it does, um, a lot of disagreements uh, and mini theories that individuals come up with to explain, for example, how dead people actually eat the food that the living give to them. Some people have no time at all for the question, they just think, you know, you're wasting your time. Other people are kind of natural philosophers who can go on for hours trying to explain how they think but those theories are very individually specific. They are idiosyncratic. Each one, come, each person, I mean, I'm exaggerating because of course people talk about it, but they're very localized and very idiosyncratic. Also, they can reason about the Anglican, but their inferences appear to run dry very quickly. So people just say, well, you know, I don't know because I've never been dead. I just can't go beyond this. I push, I push, but you know there is a point where they stop. And also, they very soon refer to things like 
well, I don't even know why we do it, but this is the customary way of doing things among the Greens or among the Mariasi people. And I, I'll go again, I don't have any empirical evidence of this, but my guess is that this would not be the case if I were to push people to talk to me about corpses, that there would be much more agreement about what happens to a corpse, that the inferences would go on for longer, and that people would not so quickly defer to the customary way of doing things. So I take this as potentially to be tested. The, the, the difference between you know, deference and the possibility of disagreement over there and relying on first-hand experience and what I think would be obvious consensus is possibly telling me that there may be a different uh, problem of signature between these two. But I don't know, and it's an open question. OK, so that was my kind of loop around the adult data. So what about the children? How do they, how did they respond to the ancestral primate? These are the data you saw earlier, the distribution of the children. And there you have the same effect. You have the same shift when primed to think about the tomb. Children were more likely to say that um, the animals will survive. So it seems, again, that it's not just this. They also have, like adults, the idea that death is the end of everything. But they also appreciate if primed that the animus has survived after death. Now, this is quite remarkable in a way because children are not tutored into knowing anything about the ancestors. I'm trying to give you here a flavor of what adults say. Well, I've mentioned perhaps to some of you, I mean, the, 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 the default is that children don't understand anything, really. All they care about is having a full stomach, so typically at a uh, offering the food to the ancestors. The kids are only interested in getting onto the rice and eat it with their bare hands. They don't really care why you're doing the ritual, who you're offering the little bowls of rice that are thrown to the ancestors, too, and so on and so forth. Not only that, children don't understand, but it's quite it's regarded by adults as being very important to actually actively uh, keep children ignorant as a way of protecting them from the potential dangers of ancestors interfering with their lives. So the idea is that the less they know about the ancestors, the less vulnerable they are to ancestral interventions which might make them ill or even so kill them. Does this even apply to 9 to 17 year olds? I mean, when does, when does somebody stop being a child from this point of view? From this point of view, it, which will become relevant at the end, Basically, when the transition from being a young person, a male, female, that sleeps around and has very active nightlife around the village, to the moment when you start making a house. And at that point, the involvement of, the, of these young people in the actual doing of the ritual seems to have a, I mean, this is how adults present it, and as far as I can tell from my observation, I think it's quite accurate. Why do they, why do they believe that knowing about uh, spirits would actually make them more vulnerable? Because thoughts about dead people are difficult. And if you have them in your head, that makes you think about things. So for example, although children I actually know much more than adults think they do about dreams, for example, and how important dreams are. So adults would say oh, they don't understand anything about dreams. Children understand a lot about dreams. And they know that dead people can come into their dreams much more than adults think they do. But the idea from the adult perspective is that if a child knows that there's possibly that his dead grandmother is going to come into the dream, that will make the child more likely to dream about the grandmother. We can go into this. Okay, so the point here is that despite the absence of explicit tutoring, of course, children have lots of first hand observations of things that adults do that imply the existence of something that survives after death. So, for example, they see elders talk 
to the dead when they do their blessing. Uh, they hear that the ancestors are making children sick or that they've even killed their siblings or friends. And of course, they, are, they witness the work that living people do for the ancestors to make them happy. So they seem to actually understand a lot, as I said, more than adults might imagine. However, I want to qualify that by reminding you that in the adult case, nothing was happening here. Whereas in the children's case, something is happening when they are asked about bodily properties. Now, before you puzzle over this, I'm not claiming, and I don't think there is actually statistically a very strong result here on the body side. So I'm just saying this is an ethnographically motivated <coughs> question. There is something is happening here that did not happen with the adults. In other words, when I ask them to think about Rapetu, who is now the ancestors, the tomb, and so on and so forth, adults only change their judgments of the mind. Children seem to do something about the body as well. They are more likely to say that the legs of Rapetu move than they were to say that the legs of Rampi move, which is something that adults don't do. Okay. And the reason I'm interested in this is because I have a, an ethnographically based story to explain why that might be so. So the question here is why should children be swayed by the tomb narrative into imagining that the ancestors not only have a functioning mind, a functioning angatse, a functioning spirit, but also a somewhat functioning body such as legs that still move. The ethnographically based answer, based on talking to kids in a very informal setting, is that there are these people, these characters called Ulu Rutetsi, uh, literally means people who re-emerge from the earth. Now this Ulu Bukatsi are very interesting to children, and children have endless stories about them. Um, all the Bukhats are people like me and you who die. They are buried. And then, as children say, there's this swirling wind that removes the sand above the coffin. And then the coffin meets, boom, boom, and the body comes out. Now, um, these guys walk back to the village. They're sent away because their relatives say, you have been dead. I don't want to have anything to do with you. They hide in the forest eating wild fruits and significantly they typically steal food that people leave out for the pigs. Now the important thing of course is that this Ulu Fukatsi have a real body. They are people like you and me. It stinks a bit. It's not very nice to look at, but it's a physical body. Okay? Do the adults believe this too or is this it just a yeah. like kids? Okay. Like kids, Vesu adults too talk about, and it comes as these things I think is quite often, they come in waves. I mean, there, there were times in, in my field work where you know, it was a bit of an of a endemic of people seeing Uru Bukhats and then it dies away and then it comes back again. Um, so they are also interested and somewhat worried and scared about this Uru Bukhats. And also, they have endless stories about them. But for adults, conceptually, it's obvious that Angatse and Urubukatsi are different kinds of entities. Angatse are immaterial, they're spiritual entities which are invisible, whereas the Urubukatsi are material. As I said, they have a body, and of course, they're visible. If you bump into them in the forest when you grow fetching firewood, there they are. You see, you smell them, and so on. Whereas for children, it seems to me that from talking to them, that they collapse the distinction between Angatse and Urufukatsi. Uh, so that for children, they're material just like you and me. So typically, the reason I came to see this is because I would ask children about Angatse, 
And what I was getting back were stories about Agatha stealing what? Pig's food, which is the prototypical food of the Uruvukatsi. They, yeah, can I just say one last thing? For children, children realize that Agatha, you don't see them. But you don't see them not because they are invisible. You don't see them because they hide. Um, so they have stories that are really descriptions of Urukukatsi in the minds of the adults, which they trans transfer to their description of who the Angatsi spiritual entities are. Does it mean that for adults, although the had no psychological problem, only No, they only do. No, 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 they do. So they're not, they're not that. zombies in our sense. <laughs> so they have psychological properties and physical properties. Where yeah, and only that and eventually they're going to die again. They tend to be, but they, they last a long time after dying and coming back. But when I when I ask adults, adults will say yes. You know, they're just like you and me. Eventually, they die again. So they are fully biological and mental. It's just that one gets sick and non-physical cannot have not physical yeah. problems. They're only non non-physical problems. Yeah. Can you differentiate from a normal person? Yes, because they give you creeps. You think the, your hair stands on you. You go. I mean, adults have. You know, I. I spent a lot of time questioning the possibility of a good uh, with the people I knew well. So I had, you know, endless discussions, and they swear to God that they do exist, and they have seen them, and they give you this terrible. So, uh, all of the are so, uh, part of the same religious system, if one can speak about that. As Angasia raises the two different levels, like all of the just for stories, uh, for entertainment. Well, I don't know whether I would say, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to get into a discussion of what religious system this might, might not be. I think the inferences that people make about Urubukatsi are different from those that they make, adults, that they make about the Angatsi. Ontologically, they're different kind of things. So, you know, the Angatsi, as I say, are immaterial. You can't see them, you can't touch them. They are only visible in your dreams when they come back as a person as she or he was at the time of death. Um, so people may dream of people a company, for example, I might dream of my grandmother and I dream of her with other people who I've never seen, but I assume that these must be ancestors that I've never witnessed. And I've heard conversations where I might go to my living grandfather and say, you know, I dreamt of granny and there was this man and, and my grandfather says, well, describe it to me. And I describe it and he can tell me, oh, that must be the father of, etc. So, but the idea <coughs> is that you, that's the only way in which you can perceptually. <coughs> and Angus and the Olobukasi are mainly in the same context, or I just. No. The end of the question People actually bury in tombs, in the tombs. Is that what the tombs are? Are they tombs? <coughs> yeah, the. So do the, the Olobukasi burst out of the coffins in the tombs? Yeah. But <coughs> sorry, I said lost my voice. So um, should you see evidence of that in terms of a burst up? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> yes. That's a very good point. I never thought of challenging them to that. This is purely a curiosity question. Um, is there any connection between, or have had to say, talk about any connection between not going through the proper rituals of um, <coughs> providing whatever it is they need for the ancestors to be happy and <coughs> and the occurrence of the coming back. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay, they have stories about whoever <coughs> people died at the wrong time and um, people were bewitched by other people and that causes them to come back to life. Sometimes they say we buried them, they were alive. Maybe they're even open to that possibility. Um, 
I, I, I won't tell you. As a curiosity, ask me later on, and I'll tell you okay. something. Otherwise, I'll never get to you. So, okay, so that's my claim, that these younger children collapse somehow in their, have not differentiated in the way adults have these two entities. And somehow, the, the differentiation seems to happen. I mean, I put 17 year olds because that was the oldest um, age that I interviewed. But with the older adolescents, who of those, some still were making, uh, didn't make the distinction, but those who did, what seems salient to them is that it's the distinction between being visible and invisible. It seems that this is what drives understanding that angles are actually are things that you don't see, whereas with Vukati you do see, is what seems to drive the differentiation when this happens. Okay, now why am I so here let me let me just recap before I move on to try and say why this is significant, uh, this whole story. So I've I've got the adults who through that contextual manipulation I argue have these two representations of what happens after death coexisting and being activated in different contexts. The, <coughs> the older children who have this notion of what happens after death and that which is in, in the process of being constructed and clarified uh, and possibly is not a copy of what adults have in their minds when they think about what happens after death. The younger children, okay, um, this is actually an important point for our group there. Um, if you do this kind of work in a place like Madagascar, you can't go back and do a follow-up study just like that. Um, so what I did not do because I ran out of time and because of the logic of how I did these studies and the motivation for why I did them in the order that I did, I never did an ancestral crime with these younger children, which of course is something I need to do. I'm going to argue from this point on that I doubt that <coughs> these kids here have anything resembling that, an, an idea that something survives, even if a bit confused after death. Because <coughs> even if I compare what these children did when prime when not ancestrally primed. They still made a distinction. There was a hint of a distinction between <coughs> body and mind, if you remember. These kids in that <coughs> same story didn't make any distinction at all. So although I'm open to the possibility that maybe <coughs> these younger children already have a representation of their life, I think they don't. But I have put that. And these kids, the five-year-olds, who don't seem to really understand anything about death at all. So let me wrap it all up and try to say something about what I think this story tells us about the process of cultural transmission. If you remember, I introduced all this with the idea, the proposal by Jesse Bering, that thinking about something that survives after death might be a natural intuition and he has a kind of evolutionary story as to why that might be so. I would say that my the evidence uh, from the basic does not support the claim <coughs> that believing in the afterlife is, as he claims, the cognitive, uh, the default cognitive uh, stance. It seems that the ascription of mental properties to the dead is something that grows with age that increases, does not decrease, as he claims, uh, which age. So anyway, <coughs> just the conclusion I draw from these data. But then I'm more interested in kind of asking, OK, so what does this story tell us about learning more generally? What kind of learning are we, uh, have, have I been describing here? I mentioned that Vesu children are not explicitly indoctrinated, as it were, into thinking about what happens after death. However, I'm putting up a report, which I really like, from an anthropologist, Christian, who has worked uh, on the choir, who writes, given the 
culturally constituted, historically constituted environment in which these children grow up. He says, no child could escape constructing a cognitive world in which the spirit, really the ancestors in my case, were ever present participants in social life, on whole life and death, success or failure depend. If you grow up in that cultural context, there is just no way not to end up thinking about the spirit taking their existence for granted. Now, I would agree that basal children too, like choir children, cannot escape uh, the ancestors, quite literally so. Um, however, what I think I'm keen to stress is that along the way, they seem to have the resources to create their own autonomous, pretty coherent and certainly very exciting understanding of what it means to be a dead agent. In other words, when these people come together, the adults come together to do a ritual for the ancestors, they have, although as I said, they're very, very idiosyncratic, they don't entirely come together, but they share the notion that what they are doing is something that they are doing for the adults who are immaterial and invisible, whereas I'm arguing that the kids who come together in that same ritual are bringing a completely different representation of these old who can see who steal the pig food and so on and so forth. Here I'm just asking why it might be, I don't have the answer, but that's another question that I think would be interesting. Why are these Uluvukatiks monopolizing the mental space of these children? Why is it that it seems to be easier for children to grasp the idea of a dead person who comes back to enjoy a full biological life as opposed to the idea of dead people who survive as immaterial agents? And I can just think of a number of possible answers to the question as to why it might be easier or harder. One could be that they get different testimony, which I don't think is the case. Um, another one is that it could be a kind of different kind of violation. Possibly my preferred one is that I think once you accept that this person has come back to life, then it's much easier to make inferences about what it does than it is with this strange immaterial agent. Um, in any case, this seems to me, if it is the case, but this suggests that it's easier to think of this than that, would be another evidence against the claim by bearing that there is something compelling about thinking of these immaterial spirits surviving after death. But I'm more keen to suggest, to, to, to point out that it also does not support the claim that children passively absorb adult uh, cultural beliefs. In other words, they have a preference in scanning the cultural environment for finding certain ideas more interesting and easier to grasp than others. So my last point about what kind of learning is that I think this story shows that children do not learn about the ancestors just by learning about the ancestors, which is the kind of facts model of cultural transmission that I was alluding to earlier. Because, although as I said, I still have to do the control study where I give the ancestral primate to the younger kids. But on the basis of the data as I have them now, it seems that before children learn that the Amitsi survives after death, they appear to have to understand death as a biological thing first. That they first have to understand that when you're dead, you're dead. In other words, that the kind of support for those ideas about the afterlife seems to be the cons can you say that? a consolidated understanding of death is a biological phenomenon, which I think I've shown stays in the minds of adults all the way through. It's present here and it continues to be salient and present when not prime otherwise throughout the life course. So I think what this suggests is that if this story is right, in other words, if, oh, sorry, 
if it is the case that this is somehow a necessary component of one's understanding of death on which children and adults then construct the understanding that something might actually survive after death, then I would argue that children may well learn about the ancestors in very unlikely places and by, from, from the point of view of an anthropologist, unlikely places and unlikely times, such as this, unfortunately you can't see it very well, a, a very young kid, the one you saw the other day was Emily, his father, pulling these are birds, which he's torturing and kind of pulling wings out of and poking eyes and eventually decapitating and learning about biological death. And this is my son Sean playing with a crab, which also very soon will die. In other words, <laughs> um, the kind of very common experience of animal death that children themselves inflict on animals may well be a very significant part of the learning process of what it means to be an ancestor. story suggests, if it's right, that the biological one might be an earlier one than the other, the ancestral story, which, of course, you know, in itself probably doesn't mean much. I'm turning to you as the... I mean, I don't know whether one could say that because it, it emerges earlier, uh, it must be in the minds of adults, the one that is more readily accessible and available in terms of the theologically correct correctness things, not the theologically correct, which is the basic concept. But I think my intuition is that it would go my way. But you are right. I mean, I said, you know, I'm presenting it in this way for rhetorical purposes, because that's what I want to convey. But of course, both stories are priming something. Um, I don't know if you've read the kind of ethnographic um, description of the two ways of thinking uh, about death. The one where you are confronted with a corpse, which is what I try to evoke with the Rampi story, with the story about going to the hospital, having the injections and dying. And the kind of narratives that people tell about what happens after death. And I think, you know, it's really, ethnographically, you can't decide between the two. And I think it's the work that I suggest one should do to find out which one is which. The difficulty with psychological methods when you add finding, and finding doesn't change anything from everyday living, you normally 
Well, but how do you know? I mean, the question is, how do you know that the thinking about the angles is the everyday reasoning? Okay, let me tell you something. No, it doesn't. Okay, can I just? I have two extra slides which I took out, but here, here you go. Um, this is this would be ethnographic evidence for the presence in the everyday mind, in the mind of my informants on an everyday basis of the representation of death as the end of everything. Now, as I said, it's, it goes unstated much more than the other one, than the ancestral story. Yeah? But there are, you find evidence of it. So here are some, you know, at every funeral when it's time to go, to take the corpse and go to the burial place, someone normally an elder with, you know, this, the people close to the deceased want to hold on to it, they don't want it to go and so on. So someone stands up and say, you know, when one is dead, one is dead, you don't hear anything, you don't feel anything, all you do is think, it's time to go, okay? Now, you could say this is just as contextualized and standardized and ritualized as the ancestral story, but it's, it gets formulated at certain times and certain contexts. The kind of matter-of-fact remarks that I described in one of my ethnographic papers where when you're handling the corpse, you just treat it as a dead piece of flesh. So, you know, things like, oh, we don't need to heat up the water to wash it, to wash the corpse because she doesn't feel anything anymore. Or you can whack the hair because she doesn't feel any pain anymore and so on and so forth. But the one that I find more compelling is that I think there are ways in which um, the context in which the ancestors are ancestors is actually ritually marked and bracketed off as being of a different kind than what I would say is the everyday understanding of what being dead is, that is the biological understanding of death. So here's my uh, adopted father who, you know, he sits in his special body language in a special place in the house, he calls the ancestors, talks to them, does the kind of thing that Maurice was describing for the Zafimahir the other day, tells them whatever he has to tell them, and then every time at the end he says, he kind of changes his body language, turns to us, the people who are behind him, witnessing the blessing, and he says, and now it's over, pose, and there is not going to be a reply. At which point everybody laughs, people get up, drink their rum, and the thing is over. Now, I interpret this. Why is he saying, and there isn't going to be a reply? There isn't going to be a reply. The ancestors reply. Yeah. <laughs> there isn't going to be a reply because the ancestors are dead and that people don't reply. It would be very daft for us to sit around and wait for them. Of course they're going to reply. If tomorrow my child dies, I will interpret that as the reply of the ancestors. But they're not going to enter a conversation with us. So, and the fact that everybody laughs suggests to me that that is you know, a way of, say, of marking that that kind of strange mode in which we assume that the ancestors are listening to us and that we can talk to them is kind of over. And beyond those brackets, death is death. It's fascinating, you have the same thing in Christianity. I mean, you know, you think that in Christianity it's all about survival of the soul, but what you say is ashes unto ashes, dust unto dust, and you throw earth on top of the coffin. You know, so in fact, it's actually something about rituals, especially about funerary rituals, and they give simultaneously contra contradictory messages. Um, I think that to be a friendly. Yes, it is a friendly <laughs> comment. Yeah. It's a friendly comment. It's just, it, 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 it's just so fascinating. Mm -hmm. that, you know, where you'd expect people to be saying, you know, uh, the survival of the soul, they're actually saying ashes on the ashes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether it means, you know, that 30 32 piece of me and the Dogoon kids, the Tertino piece, I'm talking about. 
Oh, well, she she did these certain small quasi experiments with the balloon kids, and was asking, you know, was offering them, allowing them to have sort of supernatural explanations, including ones where mm. spirits were involved. Me, he said. Yeah. Yeah, me. yeah, of course. No, not my me. Yeah, no, <laughs> so no, sorry, me. I. Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and and they were really pragmatic, sort of. Yeah. Did that have any relation with what your the the, the uh, results you have here? Do you think they're about really different kinds of those? Well, I suppose. I mean, what if I remember that piece correctly? She shows that the kids had a very pragmatic view, and the adults had bought into all this supernatural fluff. And what I don't think she shows is that the others, in certain contexts, actually reason like children in the same way that children do. So I suppose if, if you grant that that might be the case, then yes, I think there is a parallel. If you don't grant, I mean, am I right that she doesn't show? Right, she doesn't really. Yeah. She gets so the I think, you know, I would, my hesitation would be that that piece suggests that there is a radical transformation in the way children and adults reason. Whereas I'm suggesting that it's more sort of step -like, Yeah, right? which also means that yes, I've made the point here for again partly rhetorical anti-anthropology kind of purposes that kids are learning their biology experimentally by killing animals and crabs. But clearly if the story about the adults is correct, kids are also learning about their biology from adult testimony in a way that I don't think the meat story would really allow. Right. Am I picking the question? Yeah? It's, uh, I was, um, when we do the demography normally, we try not to interfere and uh, sometimes we ask questions, but try not to put uh, what we think about it, uh, the, what we think the answer should be so that we don't influence people. So actually I was wondering when you put those questions, um, how can you know that they are not also replying to be polite with you? Um, so could you tell about the framework of those questions? If they know you, how do, did you introduce um, the questions you were asking? Well, I mean, let me first comment on the fact that I think it's fantasy for an anthropology to think that by asking open-ended questions you are not influencing the outcome. I mean, you do all yeah. the time, and my favorite story is when I asked in my kind of ethnographer uh, hat, um, wearing my ethnographer hat, I asked um, how, 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 how do babies find their ways into, how do babies happen, whatever, you know, tell me your procreation theories. Very nice open-ended question. and. When I went back the second time, having had my child, one of my adoptive mothers took me to one side and said, either you were pretending not to know, or I taught you well. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, I think that, that happens all the time. Here, yes, of course, these are people I know very well. Um, these interviews caused sometimes a lot of kind of pain and emotional kind of s stuff after the, the questions were over where people would explain to me about, you know, yeah, my son died and I, I have dreams about him and so on and so forth. So, you know, things get deeper than just the silly questions. The silly questions are just an excuse. The way I introduce it is having been there for, for, for long and I can evoke in them the fact that I'm not there wasting their time and I'm not trying to trick them. And I often invoke the authority of my elder. Sometimes I say, you know, I came here the first time as a young person and I, you helped me to become a teacher and here I'm still learning, will you help me to learn more? And I, often, I always say, these are not questions about what's right and what's wrong. These are questions about how people think about things. So different people may have different ideas, and I'm interested in what you think about it. So I try my best to, I think it's the trust that counts. You know, once you get that on board, I think um, 
you know, as I said, I think that element is always present. And uh, but also, sorry, you yeah. wouldn't get an effect anyway. I mean, the point is that if it was just that they were trying to read my mind and giving me the answer I want, I wouldn't get the effect that I get. Yeah. But also, they, they, they couldn't do that without the conceptual categories that, that they're, they're displaying, right? So, so even, even if there's a demand characteristic, you have to rise to the demand. And so you're still going to be capturing something about the conceptual categories available. And sometimes they have ideas about the concepts we have that may be different from... Yeah, but that, sure. that, that, that should show up in what they say. Right? That, that shows up in the experiments here. Yeah. yeah. So actually, I'm, so the, right, so you, you kind of nearly analyze the concepts that they have and they have Of course, that doesn't apply to the kids because you know they are. Um, and and I mean, in that case, is a process of getting them used to me and having my son there, and they come and pay and draw and things, etc., etc., etc. And then you know, and then when the time when I feel they are ready, they do it and they don't seem to mind. And incidentally, I don't need to ask for it. I mean, I try. I do ask for it to permission at the village meeting and parents say, why do you ask me? Ask them. <laughs> okay. uh, coming to learning and uh, learning always is a question of uh, evolutionary stability. Like uh, in the business nowadays it, it is very important to, if you have a, a model of learning, you use it in an iterative way, so generation after generation. And you check whether the model uh, brings, uh, whether the, the gamma remains stable or whether the gamma changes, and then you can model algorithmic uh, historical changes and uh, dialects, etc. So, so, but in language, you still have a lot of communications on daily basis, and then you have a lot of feedback and everything. So, so there is a chance for the next generation acquiring the gamma of the previous generation in a faithful way. But in a, such a tacit uh, covered learning, as in, in your case, um, do you expect uh, the next generation learning the, the same thing as, uh, as used to be in the previous one? Or you expect if you would go back in a 30 years to the same place to, to, to find very different things? Well, I think I've given evidence. Well, I haven't given you evidence, but I've told you that I have found a lot of variation. And you could even see it in those graphs. I, I drew your attention to the red bar. But of course, those other little bars suggested that for some people, adults we're talking about, you know, just saying the Rapetu remembers the name of his wife, that was enough to have an idea of the answer. For other people, it wasn't remembering the name of the wife. It was knowing where the house is for him. So I've shown you that there is a lot of idiosyncratic uh, stuff going on. However, what seems to be stable is the fact that people get together and do these rituals, at which they bring their idiosyncratic ideas. And the wonderful thing is that it doesn't seem to matter a bit that I think that the ancestors eat the food because through uh, smelling the smell, and that means that when I eat it, it doesn't taste of anything because the ancestors have actually eaten the taste. And the person next door thinks that, in fact, they don't eat anything, they don't absorb the smell. All they care is to witness the fact that I'm prepared to give up my resources to make them happy. And the next person next door thinks, the child, that this is actually a wubukatsi and that the food is actually the same as the pig's food. All of that doesn't matter. The ritual, everyone thinks that the ritual has to be done and the ritual gets done. I'm sure it changes in some ways. But So I think that, you know, I, I don't know what the, 
there are, there are bound to be changes in people's ideas simply because I already know in the present that there is so much variation. But what's stabilizing the, the stuff is that everyone is committed to the fact that certain <coughs> things have to be done and they worry about doing them. So, so beliefs get stabilized could be short, that's still what you are saying. So Sorry? The beliefs get uh, stabilized uh, through rituals, so it is a ritual that the open representation of beliefs that... Yeah, I mean, I, I think I didn't get, didn't talk a lot about it. I think, I'm not sure that I want to talk about belief in the face of the evidence that I've shown where it's the same person is possibly capable, you know, at one moment thinks one thing and another moment thinks another thing. But yes, in this context, I would say that what is driving the system is, and recruiting people are these things that get done. Uh, when do we need, we need to stop, right? <laughs> <laughs> if we need to stop. No, no, come on, yeah. then. Um, but well, you should bring it to an end. Briefly, just before, I have a, a, a theoretical interpretation of some of your data, but because I'm not going to be in the method section, I just want to, for the students, I want to underline what Rita and Susan and Larry have all said, right? Which is that uh, um, there are always framing effects and there are always demand characteristics. And the correct, from my perspective, at least in the sense of being productive, stance is not to say, well, so there's uncertainty and so everything is an interpretation. Instead, it's to say, what are the framing effects? What are the demand characteristics? What does that hypothesis predict the effects of the issue be? And then look for them. I think that the kind of this, uh, you know, remarkable rapport and relationship that you've established with your informants, uh, one should strive for that for ethical reasons, and one should strive for that for motivational reasons. But that doesn't eliminate framing effects or demand characteristics. It just means that you can do the experiment better by being more specific about what you mean. Now, with regard to that, I want to go back to that. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the, the emic term for the living dead folks, the ones who walk around. Right, right. Um, it, it strikes me, and I'm just curious what your impressions are, that perhaps one of the reasons this is a grabby idea for kids is because um, there are real danger in the sense that um, if you accept that they are there in the world, um, they're much more likely to do you harm than um, the sort of uh, more distant ancestors who might visit you in dreams and they might cause sickness and illness, but in a very indirect fashion. Whereas these guys are out there in the forest, right? And they're kind of pissed off, presumably, because the people won't let them come back and they won't give them food and they have to steal animal food. And so in many ways, that should be activating a whole sort of predator slash hostile conspecific psychology. It should be a really grabby idea. I'm sorry? No, because the, the case for adults is that they believe that they believe. Uh, well, clearly the adults believe in these things, but the children are generally children are more vulnerable than adults are, right? If it's a if an adult is confronting a hostile adult, the, the risks of the adult are not the same as if the six year old is the other <laughs> 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 Would you uh, say that your data is that, that children looks like children maybe kind of natural non-Cartesians? No, I think uh, I wouldn't want to say that. I mean, I'm so I think that uh, when Paul Bloom uses Bering's results as evidence of natural dualism, he's well, I'd say he's wrong because I think Bering is wrong. But I don't think that that is the kind of... You can be a natural dualist and still the idea that the spirit survives after death is something that doesn't come necessarily for free from just being natural dualist. So the fact that you, uh, you start as a default thinking that I'm made up with a body and a mind doesn't give you the survival of the mind when, when I die. So I, I think the two things are separate. And I think that you could well show that you are an actual dualist, and yet you have to construct the idea that that bit of you survives after death. That's what I would say. So I don't think these data speak to the natural dualism. They only do insofar as Paul Bloom has used Bering's data to support the natural dualism. But the fact that you have to learn first about death 
and, and kind of death doesn't discriminate between materials and immaterial aspects of life, both go away. That kind of parsimony argument you could make that the natural stance is that, uh, you know, uh, the mind lives in body and doesn't live without body, and it's kind of hard to learn uh, to think about the mind without the body. I don't seem to be very compelling argument. Meaning that, you know, I think you can um, so if by natural if if by natural dualism you mean that we have a way of interpreting minds which is specialized and doesn't uh, so you know the kind of experiments that Bloom has about the twins and you know, the fact that you are surprised if an object goes through a solid thing, but you're not surprised if a person, assuming that those but that's data. Awesome. Of course. No, 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 no. I'm, okay. I'm saying well, if assuming that they are right, that, that would be, you know, that's the way I would understand natural dualism. And if that is so, I would think that that would give you for free the survival of the mind. I, I think they're two separate issues. Um, and yes, possibly this doesn't, you know, it's not, it would be nice if it came, if, if to be that argument, if it wasn't as I suggest, but I don't think that this necessarily, it's a kind of orthogonal to the natural rules, which I, I, I suspect. I think, I don't know, yes, um, yeah. uh, is there an explicit teaching concerning the rituals, so that children are, did they have moral evaluations, like you should do this, do they just observe and that's doing it, it is normal and you engage in doing it also? Yeah, no, there isn't, uh, I mean, there, there, there is things like uh, don't go there because, you know, no one should be to the east of the pot of rice, for example, so you kind of get kids not to walk where they shouldn't, but I've never witnessed a kind of explanation to the child as to why this is that, or I, you know, I interviewed kids the day or a few hours after we had just done this whole uh, rice cooking for the ancestors, which, and, and it was true. I mean, you know, the pot of rice is, these little bowls are thrown to for the ancestors, and then the pot of rice is given to the kids, and you, whoosh, you know, you have a kind of 30 kids with their naked hands eating this boiling rice. And that, and then you ask them, what was it? Who did we do it for? And not one child knew what this was about. They had no idea what it was about. And and that's fine. I mean, the kids should be there because part of the issue is that the ancestors enjoy, they're imagined as enjoying the kind of spectacle of this life that they have left behind, which they resent having left behind, which is why they're such a nuisance they keep wanting things. But, you know, part of the, the the, the rituals are imagined partly as well as a display of the life that they ultimately generated. So you want the kids to be there, but you don't necessarily want the kids to know why they're there and what they're doing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 